Hello. Can you hear me? It's loud in here. <laughs> so my name's Christopher Shart. I'm an LED sculptor. I'm best known for this piece. Whoop. Can we have my uh, images up? Hello back there. There we are. OK. I'm best known for this piece, which is called Firmament. It's been at Burning Man the last three years. Um, I'm also known for this piece, which is called Nova, which will be at, uh, installed at the Smithsonian later this month. They're doing a, a show about Burning Man art. Uh, perhaps you notice this piece at the front of the building, or actually two of them. I also made that one. And I've also made some kinetic fire art through the years. And just in the interest of full disclosure, I'm also a programmer and a father. I've never been to art school. Um, my mother's an Asian art historian. And my father is a landscape architect who said, never study architecture. With all that said, this is my take on the future of art. So when you go into your typical modern art gallery or museum of modern art, you almost always see that every piece has a little plaque next to it, as you see here. And that plaque talks about the creator or creators and what it is that went into that piece. It might have also a lo some lovely, very well-written interpretive text written by someone with a very nice degree that tells you how you really, really should interpret this piece and what you might think of it. Well, I mean, that's fine to a certain extent. I mean, you do want to know who made the piece, probably, but sometimes I think it goes too far. For example, very often it'll say, you know, you really should like this piece because this is such an important artist. It's just, just, see, he's, he's just so wonderful, or she's so wonderful, that, you know, never mind your eyes, it really is a wonderful piece of art. Also, sometimes the, uh, the, the text gets a little wordy. It kind of gets to be a little bit of a stretch talking about all these things in the piece of art that really aren't quite visible. Well, I think that we are undergoing a transition right now, kind of, you know, getting away from that kind of thing and t focusing on what art for what it is, what it looks like, what it sounds like, not by, you know, who created it or what school they went to or even the concept behind it, but just, you know, letting people use their senses, how, they, how it makes them think, what it makes them feel, moving beyond the plaque. So, Judging art by what it is makes a pretty large amount of logical sense because, after all, art is a means of communication. It communicates ideas and concepts, emotions, sensations. And in fact, you can say that if a piece of art doesn't communicate these things and you, know, you need a plaque to, to do it, well, the art has not done its job. It's failed as a piece of communication. Most uh, museums these days, of course, use plaques, but some don't. The DeRosa Preserve in Napa, California, uh, has hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of modern art. Each one has a little number, literally about that big, um, just saying, yeah, there it is, that's number 21. And if you really want to know more about the piece, you can write down that number on your hand and go over to uh, a catalog somewhere in the room and see who made it, maybe some thoughts about it. But what you think of that piece of art was, is only about you. It's only about you and the art. What you perceive from it, what you felt from it, rather than what is someone telling you what to do. The DeRosa Preserve has been doing this for decades, uh, but there's other museums that are experimenting with it as well. In 2015, Museum of Modern Art in New York City did a Picasso show where every piece just had a little number on it. They did the same thing with the Sigmund Polka show in 2014. And in 2013, the, the Museum of Art in Worcester, Massachusetts, rehung all their old masters with no number, no plaque, no nothing. If you wanted to know more about the piece, you kind of went over to an iPad, took a look at it. Uh, the curator of that show, or actually it was the director of the museum, said, I want to get rid of that damn piece of paper. Uh, the National Gallery in London, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and this wonderful, crazy building, the, uh, the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart, Australia, have all experimented with plaqueless exhibitions in the last seven years. And then, of course, there's Burning Man. 
Since 1986, not one plaque. The art, <laughs> thank you. The art, uh, the art pretty much lives and dies on what it is. You know, that's it. Now, this custom may have begun because in the beginning there were only a thousand or so people, and, uh, you know, chances are you knew who the artist was. Chances are you knew someone who knew. Uh, also, the art oftentimes was made to be ephemeral, burned even. Uh, and then lastly, of course, no time to make a plaque. I mean, you're barely making it out there with your art in the first place. Um, now, the, the, uh, the festival now has over 73,000 people, but this custom of having no plaques has remained, and I think it's to the benefit of the festival. It's absolutely fabulous to go there with a, with a bicycle and just ride around this dry lake bed that we call the playa, uh, and, and just find things like this wonderful piece here made by a guy from the Ukraine. You might come across a, a, a chain of teapots with wheels, and you would think to yourself, well, who made this? Why did he make it or she make it? You know, what does it mean? And, you know, can I get inside? And it's all up to you to figure that out. It's quite, no quite lovely. Uh, the answer is you can get inside, even right around. Some pieces have a pretty heavy uh, message, you know, but it's obvious, right? This piece here is called the church trap, one of my favorite pieces ever. Uh, you know, you can see a little piece of rope there by the, by the, by the stick holding it up, someone, as if a person could come and pull the rope and trap people in the church. Other pieces have so much kinetic energy that it's pretty obvious, you know, what's going on, you know, you don't need a plaque. Uh, since you're on a bicycle, you ride around, you see something in the distance, you're like, what the heck is that? It's fun to see how your perspective changes as you ride up and see what it is that you've been looking at from a distance. It's also wonderful to see a perspective shift when you find something in the day that you think is beautiful and come back at night. So Burning Man is full of very beautiful art. It's also got some bad art. But it's up to you to decide which is which. No one to tell you. you know, how did it make you feel? What did it make you think? Is it profound? Is it funny? Is it stupid? Is it lame? You know, it's all up to you to decide that. I think that's pretty beautiful. Now, actually, there is one thing that might actually influence you, and that is other people. Uh, some of the most successful pieces have drawn a crowd. You can see right here. I do believe that Burning Man is a bit of a rare meritocracy. Um, no, since you know, there are no big names out there, um, very often somebody who no one's ever heard of before makes a piece and it ends up being the piece that everyone talks about. This is a, an art car called Pulpo Mechanico, uh, a mechanical octopus. Uh, that was a huge deal for actually several years. It's still very, a very big favorite. And I love this piece particularly because in the era of very, very high-tech, very sophisticated art, which, you know, I'm guilty of that, this piece is made of garbage, literally. It's made of trash cans and old mixing bowls and hubcaps and, you know, crappy pipe and everything, and it spins around and bangs and shoots probably a gallon of propane at a time up in the air. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, now, you probably have heard a slogan from Burning Man. It's no spectators. No spectators. Well, it's actually more of an aspiration than a rule. But it is sincerely a wish and an invitation to everyone in attendance to present some form of art at least some of the time. So that can be as simple as a costume. Yes, that's me on the left in 1999. Um, it can also, it, no spectators, is also uh, an invitation to the fools out there who want to spend insane amounts of money and time to bring sophisticated, complicated, fragile, kinetic art out to the playa. Um, that's me on the ladder in 2000, uh, trying to nurse my broken art back to, back to life. I failed. Burning Man is a wonderful blank canvas of almost infinite size. It's so large that you can demonstrate the curvature of the earth. This piece did, does that by having a laser beam that shoots a straight line, and then it has a series of posts with dots on them that mark the actual curvature of the earth. And over the course of 2.6 miles, guess how much they diverge? Like about seven feet. Very cool. 
But I think the thing that most, the, the most important thing that Burning Man does is it gives permission to normal people who never thought of themselves as artists, who never went to art school, to put their ideas out there, to, to, to just kind of have some silly idea that they had one night over drinks, or a really um, intense, complicated idea that they developed over weeks and months, and put it out there. And it has transformed the lives of several people I know and a whole lot more people who I've never met who now call themselves artists because of the amazing, inviting, blank canvas that Burning Man is. Now, of course, as you may have guessed, it transformed me too. This is my first piece made in 2000. It's called Spin. It's 12 feet tall, 12 feet in diameter. And like the, the wheels in the front of the building here, it creates a digital display by, with motion. Those arms spin around really fast, creating a cylindrical digital display. Although this is a long time ago, that's only 16 pixels tall. In 2001, I made this piece. Um, you have to know that Burning Man has a big theme every year, right? This is the, you know, sometimes it's like time and space. Well, in 2001, the theme was the seven ages of man, you know, just from the Shakespeare speech. And, you know, I, I thought this was a, a little heavy-handed, so I, I thought I'd make fun of it by making the seven ages of spam, this, this lovely ornate dish. Uh, the tray had uh, seven dishes across it, each one labeled with a day of the week and a can of Spam glued there too. And every day I would go and I'd open the can, place it on the plate, and just leave it there to rot, along with all the Spam from the previous day. So everyone could see the seven ages of Spam, how it ages over time. Now in reality, what happens is that each piece of Spam gets covered with an alkali shell, an alkali dust shell, and it doesn't rot. It's very, very disappointing. In 2002, I made an art car. You know, everyone wants to make an art car. Uh, this one's called Ping. And uh, because I'm an engineer, of course, I overdid it. Uh, the, the, the periscope works. Uh, it has fresh water, it has pressurized fresh water inside so I can squirt people. It has a, uh, has a working propeller. In 2003, I made this piece called Yantra, which is mostly electroluminescent wire. And uh, it's 92 feet in diameter and 40 feet tall. It's um, the little green and red patterns that you can barely see are symbols from each of the world's great religions. And, uh, and, they, and then the light in the middle symbolizes the, the eternal truth that every one of these religions strives to express. Uh, this piece taught me a very important lesson, and that is that uh, some of the best art pieces are places. Uh, settings for people to come hang out. And if you can tell, you can't see the picture, can you? Oh my God, it's so dim. Well, sorry about the, the you can't see the picture, but there's people hanging out underneath it all night long. Uh, there were weddings, there were proposals. I, I was very thrilled to have that be uh, part of their experience. In 2004, me and my wife decided to make a piece together. It's called Nebula. It's a model of the Crab Nebula, and holy crap, you really can't see that. Well, anyway, um, there, there's, a piece, there's a piece of it in the middle is this machine here, this metal ball that spins around shooting propane out at diagonals. It's a model of the neutron star inside the, uh, uh, the Crab Nebula. In 2005, I thought I'd take one year off from doing Burning Man art. Why? Because I was so infected with Burning Man and that spirit that I thought it would be a really great idea to buy a warehouse and make a home within it. And so I, you know, got to it. And uh, four and a half years later, <laughs> I had a home. Um, I did my own architecture. I did a lot of the, the building myself. Uh, I didn't quite disobey my father. I didn't go to architecture school, but I did do architecture. Here is the result. Um, I also, of course, had, to, I had another project to work on starting in 2008. Can you see my daughter there? Just barely. This project's still ongoing. Here we are, welcoming in the Obama era. In 2010, I got back on the Burning Man art horse. This piece here, I guess you can see it, is called Four Pyre Squared. It rotates on two axes, tracing out the surface of a sphere. At the ends of those arms are two propane burners, and they shoot out flames in the opposite direction. The motion of this piece is entirely derived from the thrust of the propane. I didn't want any hydrocarbons going to waste. 
This is what it looks like at night. Oh, Lord. But we'll have to see this one online. In 2011, I made two more pieces that were also this kinetic fire art thrust thing. Uh, I brought all three of them out into the desert and called it Garden of Rockets. This is what Garden of Rockets looked like at night. And then in 2012, I kind of took this kinetic fire art thing to its uh, conclusion, creating char wash, uh, a purification station. I got this idea that it would be fun to have the audience on the inside. You can barely see, but there's like a, a group of people inside this little corral while these four great big uh, 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 fire apparatuses get ready to go. And here's what it looks like when they're going. I can't believe the fire marshal made, well, was okay with this one. Not only at Burning Man, but in San Francisco. So I brought that back out again in 2013. And I, uh, uh, you know, I was just beat. I was just tired. I said, okay, I had enough of this fire art stuff. And I started playing around with LEDs. And uh, to make a long story short, eventually in 2015, I made this piece, Firmament, the one I talked about before. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been back in 2016 and, and 2017. And once again, I learned this amazing lesson that the best art pieces are places. There were weddings. There were proposals. There was live classical music performance. And in fact, in each one of those smaller pyramids around the edge, uh, there's a, a pretty big speaker so they're playing classical music at very present but not particularly loud volume. It was just loud enough to shut out all the thump, thump, thump of the of what Burning Man has become so yes you, uh, you could say that I was once a mild-mannered engineer now I'm a desert rat uh, I like to say that I, I recently transitioned from being a programmer who does art for fun to being an artist who does programming for fun most of my programming is in this iPad app that controls my my uh, LED sculpture there I am on the left operating my iPad uh, operating firmament this iPad app is actually available to anyone I, I make it available on the iTunes store, and it's called LED Lab, and I, I'm very proud that thousands of LED artists use this app worldwide to control their pieces. So, is Burning Man and the Burning Man ethos infecting the wider art world? I think the answer is yes. The Hermitage Museum and Gardens in Norfolk, Virginia, hardly the hotbed of radicalism, uh, had a show last year called The Art of Burning Man, and they brought a few big pieces out. You know, there's the big boot, the Charlie Gattakin piece. And in about 20 days, the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution is doing a show, a, a 10 month show called No Spectators, The Art of Burning Man. So, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think it's leaking out. I think we're, we're having our impact on the world. Now, yes, I think this transition is happening, but I, there's still a place, you know, some people still want to have art that's a riddle, you know, something that you have to figure out. I mean, you know, there's a lot of art students out there that need to write theses, right? So you want to, you know, you need art that's inscrutable. And there's a place for that. I have nothing against that at all. But I do think that the wider public is really enjoying the fact that we're seeing more and more art that really just kind of hits you with a big wow right away. You know, you just say, there, that's it. That's, that's, that's really moving me. You know, stuff that just kind of, you know, hits you, gives you some warmth, you know, cold, whatever. Or maybe it's a piece that makes you go, what the heck is that? But, you know, it's thought-provoking on its own. You don't need the plaque. Or maybe it's playful. Or maybe it's just sublime. So why is this happening? Why are we facing this kind of transition right now? Uh, unfortunately, I think that it's partly because we work too hard. We spend all our time in front of our screens making our living. And when, when we're done doing this, we want to take a little break. We really would prefer art that speaks to us immediately or maybe is very profound. So when we go to web pages, we look at art, we kind of want to have it, you know, come at us rather easily. And if we actually get outside of our cubicles so we can actually go enjoy that living we're earning, we would love art that is immersive and, 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 and overwhelming and really gives us this amazing experience. And guess what? Immersive art is now a thing. There's several installations around the world, that more and more. I want to talk about one particular piece of immersive art exhibition, and it's called Meow Wolf. It's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And when you go to Meow Wolf, you enter this nondescript-looking building, 
and then you go into what looks like kind of a somewhat ornate house, and you're invited into this house, and you can open every cupboard, you can go to open every door, you can look around, and you can find the secret passages. This one in a dryer, you slide into the dryer, just like being John Malkovich, and you enter a phantasmagorical world of color and light and delights and things, more things to discover. Meow Wolf began, of course, as alternative, low-budget thing, but guess what, folks? Very successful. It's now one of the major tourist draws of Santa Fe. You know, you see it all, in all the brochures. And uh, they've done well enough by their ticket sales and some grants that they are now opening permanent exhibitions in Denver and Las Vegas as well over the next couple of years. Things like this used to be on the fringe. Not anymore. So here's my conclusion. In the Middle Ages, it was really codified what art is, what it should be, more or less two-dimensional and having something to do with the New Testament. The Renaissance came along, and smarty pants artists in Florence stretched the rules. They discovered perspective. They started painting things of, kind of everyday life. Well, fast forward a few hundred years, and, you know, art's gotten kind of codified again, and particularly in France. They're like, well, you know, if you're an artist, you must be able to do a landscape, and you must be able to do a still life, and you must be able to do a clothed form and a nude form, and it must be just so. Along comes Edouard Manet, and he decides that he's going to have a little fun by putting all of them in one painting, Déjeuner sur l'herbe. It's a landscape. It's a still life, it's a nude form, it's a clothed form. What's the problem? Well, the Salon de Paris was not entertained. They thought it was uh, uh, rather immoral, and they rejected it handily. But, you know, Manet, he didn't care. He and his friends, other Impressionists, they went on to paint what they saw, what they felt, exactly the way they wanted to make it. And I think we'd all agree that these Impressionist works are now considered to be an apex of creative endeavor. So I feel that art has become over-codified again. This time, it's in the form of over-intellectualization. You know, art is now expected to have you know, a thoroughly detailed explanation and a, and a meaning that has to be explained with a paper and a plaque and everything. It even needs to have like a justification for existence. I mean, if you want to get out of art school these days, you better know how to write. That's what it comes down to. Sometimes complicated logic and even algorithmic uh, devices are used to create the art, never mind how it looks. So yes, I feel we're at the apex perhaps an inflection point of a revolution. I think we're getting back to for looking at art for what it is. A rational, emotional, deep, thought-provoking form of communication that brings delight and wonder, makes you scratch your head, is elegant and sublime without the plaque.